Hey Roanoke, welcome back and thanks for joining me on another episode of If You Know, You Know, a municipal podcast bringing you all things Roanoke and taking you behind the scenes to meet some of the amazing folks who are making things happen all over the city of Roanoke. I'm your host, Carol Corbin, and joining me today will be Roanoke's Arts and Culture Coordinator, Doug Jackson, who will be talking about how art can impact and elevate economic and community development. Also joining us is Brian Hancock, a recipient of one of Roanoke's Art Matters grants is here to share with us about the importance of the spoken word as an art form and an upcoming youth poetry camp at Melrose Library. Our first guest today on If You Know, You Know is Arts and Culture Coordinator, Doug Jackson. Doug, thank you for joining us today. Hey, Carol, thanks for having me. So Doug, can you tell us a little bit about what you do for the city? Sure, I'm the Arts and Culture Coordinator, and uh, I have the real joy of staffing the Roanoke Arts Commission, which has 15 volunteer members of the community that council appoints to oversee and kind of make connections with arts and culture, and we've got a bunch of things we do as part of that. So one thing we do is the public art program, and we have uh, more than 170 works of, uh, in our permanent public art collection, and then we do temporary shows. Additionally, they oversee funding for arts and cultural organizations in the community, and okay. we oversee arts and cultural planning for the community. So, Planning, so sort of like the succession of what art and culture will look like for the next 5, 10, 20 we, years? Or? Yeah, yeah, and we think that's a pretty broad thing. We're looking at the intersection. So how do the arts make us a better community all the, all the way around? How do they help us achieve our goals with the economy? How do they help us achieve our goals with equity and justice? How do they help us achieve our goals in any number of ways, including being a healthier, more connected community? I love that. And well, you're mentioning many of our um, strategic points within the city. So the economy, livability, equity, all of those um, big issues that we really like to, to say that Roanoke is on the forefront of and art is on the forefront of those issues. Yeah, we think it's a really accessible way to dive in. And I applied for the job when I knew that uh, City Plan 2040 was coming out. Um, They already had a draft version of it. And interwoven equity was a part of that, a big piece of it, as well as community wellness. And those were really new focus areas for the city, I think, and making those a priority. And the Arts Commission dove right into it. So they... So the 2040... Have you only been with the city for a few years? Yeah, I started in uh, 2019. 2019. Yeah. It feels like you are interwoven with the city. Oh. It, it well, definitely feels like, you know, your your position with uh, the Arts Commission and as the Arts and Culture Coordinator that you've just been here for, for 10, 15, 20 years. Well, I will say that I moved to Roanoke 19 years ago and I did a, a Master's in Fine Arts at Hollins University. Oh, yeah. And the first thing I did when I graduated was apply to be on the Roanoke Roanoke Arts Commission. Okay. And so I volunteered with the Arts Commission for, I think, 13 years or so before uh, coming into the, before the, coming the staff into position. Before coming into it. Yeah. That's really fascinating. Yeah. It, but it does. I mean, I guess that sort of gives you a little bit uh, more of that interwoven feeling because you have been a part of it in some way. Mm-hmm. But it definitely feels like, um, yeah, you, you feel very connected to the community. Does art give you that sense of connection? Oh, yes. Yeah, that's it, you hit it right on the head. Um, that's how I engage, um, both in, as a consumer or, you know, I appreciate art. I enjoy going out to the events. Um, you know, I, I'm a writer, so I write. Um, I also do a little, uh, some, some, some visual artwork. You know, I fiddle. It's part of a fiddle. contemplative <laughs> practice for me as well. Um, yeah, it's just, it's the way I connect and dig in. And I felt like Roanoke is the kind of community where if you want to make something happen, you can find a way to do it. You can find the support. Uh, it's a small enough size community to get involved, but it's also got the resources and people love it here. Um, yes. and that's what makes people want to contribute to make it a better place. And if, if you love quilting, if you love a musical performance, you play the harmonica, you draw, you whatever you're passionate about, there's some way to align that with making the community a better place. And that's what we're trying to find. I love that. Also, I 
am completely down for making the community better through quilting. And I think that needs to be, we need to find a way to elevate that. <laughs> oh, I w that's what this year has been about. We funded, uh, well, 110 artists received uh, funding to explore a process, whether mm -hmm. we did the self-portrait projects. Um, and there was one that was a fiber. I saw that. Yeah. I saw that, yes. <laughs> yeah, so we had the self-portrait project. We gave grants to artists to do projects that they said, this is going to make the community a better place through art. Uh, those, so we funded... Um, 100 and 100 plus processes uh 21 of those were black led um justice and and making sure everybody's involved is an important piece of that uh but we want to have structures to say yes because people come to the city a lot of the times with a good idea and if we don't have a way to say hey that's terrific can you take the lead on that how can you help us achieve that yes and so that's what we're experimenting and we will help us say yes yeah yeah so this really, we've said all along, um, we don't know how to do this. Uh, we're trying to do it. Uh, we want to learn lessons as we go together. And so far, we're having a lot of fun doing it, and we're seeing some, some impacts. And so one of the reasons um, I'm having you on today uh, in sort of our economic development section is to talk about how arts and culture affect our economy here in Roanoke. Um, in your opinion, how does the art scene in Roanoke help elevate and impact our local economy? Yeah, it does it um, both in economic development and in community development. You know, I'm a firm believer that we've got to have a strong, resilient community in order to be prosperous. So on the very foundational level, all the ways we've just kind of discussed make a difference. But then additionally, we have an arts and culture sector, mm -hmm. a creative sector, that is creating jobs. Uh, they're bringing tourist dollars in. Uh, if you think about the visitable sites, like the museums. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Yeah, the performances. You know, the concerts down at Elmwood Park, uh, which are so joyful. Um, it's just a special place. Um, all of these are adding up, and, and we work occasionally, we'll do a study. And the last study was done before the pandemic, but said that, you know, the, the economic impact of the arts and cultural sector uh, was about $64 million. So if you think about somebody coming downtown and saying, oh, I'm going to have a, I'm just going to go downtown and oh, well, we'll have dinner before we go to uh, the concert. Go to the concert, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or I'm going to buy a new tie. Uh, <laughs> not that people wear that many ties. You might, 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 might be buying a new Hawaiian <laughs> shirt before I go out, go out to yeah. the concert. Uh, <laughs> so those, those things we think r really do add up. And so there are, uh, and think about all the, the jobs that, come into play with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And it, it helps to make our community more vibrant and, and more beautiful just to walk around in. Um, I've, I've mentioned this before. We had um, your intern, Miriam, on recently, and she was talking about all of the cataloging she's doing of the, the art within Roanoke and the mural scene in Roanoke. I'm, I'm not much... I've said it before. I'm very much of a Philistine when it comes to art. I, I know what I like, but I have uh, no educational basis for what makes it good but I really love sort of the the leaning into murals that we've gone into I love walking on the greenway and just seeing something pop out at you that really represents the sort of outdoor culture that we have here in Roanoke it, that to me is I love it yeah you know it's a, it's another way that people uh, are attached to the community. Um, so these special things, the Dorothy Gillespie mural that just was redone yes. uh, here downtown, uh, we heard so many stories of people who said, oh, I grew up with that mural. When I was young, that, that, that was part of downtown to me. And right. you can hear, that, hear it in their voice when they talk about it. So it's that attachment. Um, we've been doing a lot of work where people can help paint murals or help, you know, everything we do, we try and get people involved in deciding what are the goals of the project? What, yes. Who's the artist who's going to do the project? Everything, for, and then um, who wants to roll their sleeves up and actually paint the mural? And so this summer we'll have probably another 60 people working on the River's Edge North mural. And that's literally putting your, you know, your fingerprint on the world around you. Absolutely. And so the next time you're at River's Edge, you know, in the Play Roanoke Kickball League, and you look over and you see that what was once an ugly wall that's now completely transformed, you can be like, that That was me. Like, I was part of that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, and that's, 
people understand the power of murals now. And of course, the, the, the thing we really want to do is help use that tool to revitalize neighborhoods. So we don't want them all to be downtown or the, Absolutely. yeah. And so we've got, we be on the lookout. We'll have two muralist in residence uh, beginning this summer. Fantastic. And their job is going to be to help uh, match artists with walls. Uh, so and we, they've got a budget to help do it. And um, we are going to see kind of a, a, a more rapid creation That's of so these. That's so cool. I love yeah. that. Well, because one of my questions to you, which is probably going to be really hard since you've been a part of so many different projects, is what piece of art in Roanoke is your favorite? Because I'm going to go first. And if I take it, sorry. But <laughs> the the mural on the greenway going towards southeast not the one that's at the bennington trailhead but the one that's sort of on the greenway going there that bright brilliant purple with mm -hmm. the um cedar wax wing i oh my gosh that's so amazing like the color just makes me want to like live there yeah and that's right at ninth street yes and right under the bridge and right near riverdale which is going to be a, a, a big very, new neighborhood mm -hmm. in, in roanoke that'll need some big new art yeah yeah <laughs> yeah oh i do love that one and yeah. it, it is hard to pick a favorite but i will you tell have you to. okay i have to so i'm going to talk <laughs> about one piece it's called winter wonderland and it is on loan to us right now from david ramey jr um, and it's one of his father's works and um, this, we talked about the, what art can do. Um, I think part of the economic uh, story is that we are a place worth investing in. We are, if we, you know, we're a city, we've got challenges, but we're taking the challenges, addressing them head on, trying to rectify errors from the past. And so if you think about um, what happened with urban renewal and David Ramey Sr. painted or drew with, um, with colored pencil, just from memory, just hundreds of images of what Northeast Roanoke, Gainesboro, 11th Street, um, what it used to be like. And Winter Wonderland is on loan and it's hanging in the Gainesboro Library. And if you look at it, it's the view that he would have seen kind of from his house looking down at the Gainesboro Library. Kids are playing in the library, it's a snowy scene. But at the same time, there is this wash above it. And so something is coming. It's, and the wash is kind of a heavy, gray, ominous. oppressive, an ominous cloud. Yeah. And so much is happening in that picture. And it's spectacular. Um, so I invite people to go to Gainesboro Library, which is such a special place anyway, and go back in the community room. And we've got about seven other pieces of Mr. Ramey's. And we're going to have a big retrospective of his work at the Taubman Museum of Art and the Harrison Museum beginning October 6th. October 5th is going to be the big celebration for that. That's great. Yeah. I know, um, again, when I first started in communications a few years ago, I started really getting immersed into a lot of different departments within the city, art being one of them. and. I was able to meet uh, David Ramey Jr. through a couple of different projects we were working on. And I was like, where is this? This name is familiar. What is this? And we have two of David Ramey Sr.'s um, drawings on the wall right outside like the suite of offices so, where I work. And so I walked by them every day and I would look at them and they're great. But like I couldn't put that together. And now that they're there, like every time I see them, um, it's just a really important connection that makes me feel more connected to the community just knowing that yeah yeah um it, yeah it's really great they're that's, wonderful that's a that's a really um interesting pick i appreciate that because you know again the sort of least artistic person in the room right now um the mural is colorful and pretty and outside and it's great it's my favorite so i'm gonna love it but also i think that some of the smaller works that we have dispersed throughout the community that maybe are more hidden gems mm -hmm. um, to get people more interested and, and more interested in the history of Roanoke is really impressive. Yeah, yeah, we, we and you mentioned Miriam, um, we've got an online presentation now of our collection so people will be able to flip through it and look at it and we're really excited about that. We want people to engage with it. That's great. Well, Doug, it's time for us to introduce a new guest to the show. Joining us now on If You Know, You Know is Brian Hancock. Brian, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Brian, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the type of work that you've been doing with the city? Oh, well, um, I, uh, 
I, I consider myself an artist, uh, first and foremost. Uh, I've lived in the city, well, my whole life. And um, I've worked with uh, the arts uh, locally for Roanoke City with different projects like the Empathy Project where, you know, we, we connected uh, poetry and I, I, I mean, with poetry and music and uh, visual art uh, to help comfort those who've been through tragedy as far as gun violence in our community. Um, I, I run uh, Soul Sessions, which is a poetry group. I'm a writer myself and, uh, I'm, uh, and an artist, hip hop artist. Um, and I do different things. <laughs> <laughs> you do a yeah. lot of things. You're yeah. selling yourself short. Yeah. You're also the artist in residence with Carillion? Yes, I am an artist in residence with Carillion. I've been uh, with them for three years. And with them, I've worked in different uh, areas, whether it be uh, creative writing with uh, teens and adolescents on the unit uh, for uh, uh, the uh, psychiatric unit. Um, and now I'm new to the team full time. Uh, they, they offered me a position. So not only am I an artist in uh, residence, but I'm, st I'm now a new fully uh, employed em uh, employee sorry I'm nervous no don't um, be nervous <laughs> <laughs> but yeah uh, I, I, I'm I work on the adolescent unit full-time now um, a lot of my programs they seem to be very effective so they've given me a, a full-time position and I'm, I'm very grateful that's great to hear and so the type of work that you do uh, with those youth at Carillion I'm sure that it's helpful to them because nobody is is usually in a hospital for a number of good things. Um, typically you're there because things are scary um, or unknown. And the type of work you that you do, um, does that sort of help kids be able to process their feelings, be able to you know get out some creative energy in that situation? Yeah, yeah. Um, what we do is uh, writing themes and musical prompts. And we have conversations about how they uh, kind of... Uh, affect us and you know telling our stories because our stories are very important and so it's more about having them engage and kind of look deeper you know we live in such a world now where um, a lot of misogyny and addiction and violence kind of takes the forefront and uh, as far as like even in our music we, we see a lot more of that heavily uh, grained in a lot of material so it's it's important to let them kind of reflect and look back and peel back the layers. And, you know, when you're in a place like, uh, you know, those kind of facilities, um, you have time to think. Um, so I just want them to know that they're fearfully, wonderfully made and loved and that they have options and, you know, um, to tell their stories and be bold enough to, you know, have those conversations through poetry and, 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 and putting words together and journal writing. Because uh, that's what I used to do when I was a kid. I still journal to this day. So it's just like uh, when I was growing up and a lot of things were just kind of wild around me. Uh, and I didn't understand what was going on. Uh, my aunt, she uh, put my first journal in my hand. And I had been writing ever since. And so um, that has opened a lot of doors for me. And so, you know, if that's something that's their, their, that's their art, I want to see them allow see them open up doors and it doesn't have to be creative writing it could be visual art it could be any type of art just letting them know hey you have options and and and, and kind of take a look around uh, ourselves and get away from destructive or self-harm or self-destructive behaviors to uh, let them know that they they have options well and for any of our listeners who aren't aware, um, the type of art that you most often work with is the spoken word. Yes, yeah, spoken word. Uh, I, I, I grew up uh, reading Nikki Giovanni. I grew up uh, reading a lot of different uh, poets of all types of genre, I, but I gravitate to hip hop artists and music artistry in the way hip hop artists put words together. Because, I mean, that was the household I grew up in. Mm -hmm where like we got, I, I came from an era where you saw a lot of those positive influences in hip hop to let you know cautionary tales of what was really going on and being those street reporters um, to things that we didn't see, but you know, also saying, hey, you don't have to go this way. You don't have to go that route. 
and just letting you know the things that they that, that people were seeing that we don't necessarily talk about. Well, and giving a voice to the voiceless. Exactly. Yeah, and and to hear those stories that that a lot of us don't get exposed to. So, in speaking of the type of art that you are are most impacted with when it comes to spoken word, when it comes to music, what would you say? How how did you cultivate this art? Did you did you go to school for it? Is it self taught? Is it something that's kind of just in you? Where, where did that yeah, come from? It's a from? mixture of being self taught and what's in me. And like you know, I grew up listening to like Gil Scott Heron. Uh, I grew up listening to like those artists that you know were just like they 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 punched you with their words, and it was fierce. And they had commentary on all the things that are going on, and not just society, but how it related to their world. And so I, w I wanted to do that, you know, and it was something I wanted to do. And um, it was just something that I was always interested in. So, like, I was like, why not me? And, you know, those yeah. books were in, in, in you know, I, I would eat up any book that was given to me. My Angela, you know, my, my aunts, my aunt Anissa and my aunt Lynn. And, you know, I had different family members that would just say, hey, check this out. And, and then not just family members, it was community um, that really helped me, especially growing up. I had a great teacher, English teacher, named Miss Clater at William Fleming. I graduated from William Fleming, uh, class of 2000. What's up? Um, Shout out Fleming. Uh, so I, I had teachers that encouraged me. They would read my, my stories. I would write short stories in high school. And they were like, this is what you need to be doing. So I had great people who were teaching me and then also me being in a position where I just in, in, in immersed myself in hip hop culture and, and the genuine hip hop culture because sometimes we can get it so confused with uh, rap music. Rap has always been about the lie. Hip hop has always been about a culture of being free and, 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 and finding out what you're about and telling your stories. And so it was me wanting to be about about that. And I was like, why not me? And, and it came to that resolution. It was like, why not me? Why can't I do these things? And so, like, you know, it put me on a path of self-discovery and being more aware and, 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 and writing and talking about my feelings, whether it be a hip-hop song or whether it be a, a spoken word track or me just talking from my perspective because when you're talking from your truth, um, there's nothing but you can't take that away from somebody because it's their experiences. You can't, but that's also really brave because when you're having those truthful conversations or when you are listening to a song that's coming from maybe somebody's worst experience or or someone's, you know, internal truth, that takes a lot of vulnerability yes. to get there. But it's also a superpower. It is. It is a superpower. That vulnerability is. And so that is that something that you sort of are able to incorporate and in when you're working with, you know, youth or when you're, you're working with others in spoken word mm -hmm. is sort of that um, power of vulnerability? Yeah, it goes hand in hand. Like I'm, I'm sharing my experiences, you know, sometimes even in class I will give a poem that I've written or will examine a poem or a song that somebody else has written and have those conversations and engage. And you know, it's about challenging and asking questions and having it kind of be free form towards like, I can relate to that lyric, I can relate to this. And they really step up to, the, in, to those occasions. And like, if you give kids the opportunity, they, they can rise to those occasions, especially if you show them something that they've never seen before. They didn't know that was an outlet no, to, or no, that was a path no. they could take. We went over and listened to a couple of Lauren Hill songs a couple of weeks ago. Which ones? And, uh, Everything is Everything. Everything. And then uh, there's a song where uh, she's exploring, uh, you can get the money, you can get the power, keep your eyes on the final hour. So it's like this, this song about, you know, evolving with purpose and being yourself versus uh you know the challenges of just like consumption and and pulling ourselves into negative places it's about finding out what you're about and 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 I, and I like to use those type of music that type of music and those methods of teaching 
this so so they are more ex- explorative for themselves of like what's going on with me you know why I'm you know we don't really talk about the why because sometimes we we live in such a fast food society on so many levels whether and when I'm saying fast food I mean even spiritual it's like you know uh, social media you know I use it as a great tool for promotion but sometimes it's like we look at everybody else's situations and it's like well I have to have that Balenciaga I have to have that Gucci bag I have to have all these different things when really if we just focused on the things that we could be content about and find out what that meant we'd be a lot better off not the cure all but it, it, it's it's about being content and finding out what you're about and saying no thank you yes please more of this more uh, more positivity if you will because those things are important but we live in such a, a age of just you know internet access to everything so everybody thinks that we have that answer but what about the the literacy of the heart what about the literacy of what it means to connect the heart and the mind to the destinations that are genuine that could help us I was getting ready to ask you a question and now I think you just answered it when it comes to spoken word do you think it's more powerful for a sentence to be well constructed and to be well constructed in a way that it's emotional and impactful or is it more important to just get your truth out of your body get it out of you get it out and you know sometimes I I've I, I do I do revision. There's no piece for me that is ever truly closed. Like I'll revisit things and like you know do things more clever uh, than than I have because it's it's fun for me. It's like yeah. puzzle building with words. Yeah. And so no piece to me in my mind is ever done. And so I like to you know incorporate you know even when my sessions we talk to the kids and like hey. You know, even though this session is done, you take your time and find fun ways to say what you want to say. And so it's important to have that that progress with play and, and, and to do something like more productive with our time. If that's one thing that can be productive, you know, then please do that. If it's visual art, please do that and know whatever piece you, you, you do, never done. And so for me, it's like a mixture of, of like the bare bones of like what I'm thinking and I'll jot down ideas, but then I'll go back from the ideas and I'll think about my day. I think about um, something pop culture that could relate to those ideas or use pop culture references in it or something that somebody done that irritated me in the news (laughs) and, 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 and just throw it all in the blender and have fun. So you mentioned earlier about not comparing yourself, especially in social media, and to find those places of contentment. But it sounds like with your work, your work is always unfinished. Mm-hmm. Do you find contentment in the process? Yes. Okay. And, and it is a good thing and a bad thing for some of my family <laughs> and friends. Because when I get that, when I get that feeling, I want to create then everything shuts down and like it has it has broken a few relationships to be honest because like I'm very very immersed in like what it means and what where am I going what am I doing and and it's important to have those conversations for me and it's important that I create is that creative process for you something that is mostly internal or do you find that creative process having conversations with others I learn so much from other people and it's a blend of both. both. It's a blend of both because it's like initially when I started, when we started Soul Sessions, um, there was a lot of things that I was ignorant about, naive about. But when people are, are telling their genuine stories from their perspectives of life and the things that they've been through and their truth, it it honestly humbles you and changes you. Like I initially, I wanted to, when I was doing the program, I only said I was going to do it for one year. And here we are almost 10 years in. And so um, <clears throat> with it, it was a thing where I was learning so much and it, it, it humbled me because, you know, I, I, 
I kind of restricted myself to like the boxes of, of in life, you know, checking boxes off. But there's so we're so much more complex mm. than the boxes that we try to put people in. And so what art does, it opens all those things up to say, wow, you you are really you're really exploring your ideas, you're exploring your craft, you're ex and you're exploring what it means to really live out loud. And so when artists give, or when people are given a chance to do that, they surprise you every single time. Because nobody is just one thing. Boom. Yes. Nobody is just one thing. And so it, it, it's a thing where we have to put ourselves in, 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 in a seat to be teachable. And we, we often don't do that because some people are like, this is, I want to simplify it. I think I have it figured out, but it's, we're so much more. And thank God we are. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, before we start talking about the uh, summer of poetry that we're coming into, the last question that I have for you that may take you a moment, we may have to edit out some silence. <laughs> <laughs> is there, is there a phrase or a song or a word is there something for you specifically that you've read that you've listened to as a spoken word artist that that song that sentence that whatever has hit you or or you felt it so emotionally mm. that it's it's just stuck with you or it's changed you there wow I, um stevie wonder who is one of my favorite artists he said, true love asks for nothing. It's acceptance is the way we pay. And for me, that hit me on every level. Like, I can go to Stevie Wonder for advice on love. I can get, I can go to Stevie Wonder on any type of subject, and he will feed your soul directly. You can tap into any Stevie Wonder song, and there is a lot of answers to anything. Like, right now... I'm listening to uh, Hotter Than July, and it is July. <laughs> um, but uh, that's one of my favorite uh, records. And um, But you can listen to any artist and find so many answers. So that was one of the answers that hit me and as a phrase that has stayed consistent with me my entire life. True love asks for nothing. It's acceptance is the way we pay. And he said it in a way, the way he said it was like he's telling you, hey, did you know that true love asks for nothing? It's acceptance is the way we pay. And so to me, it means just pay it forward genuinely and, 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 and stop rolling with the mindset of thinking that you're owed anything. Just accept it and just be present in your moments and, 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 and find out through the highs and lows of what it means to love and just be patient. Very, very well said. That's a great example. I love that you pulled in Stevie Wonder. I have, was actually listening to Superstitious on the way into work today, so it's a Stevie Wonder kind of day. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> that's that, that's one of my feel good like driving into work songs. Yeah, um, yeah. But that's just a, a very nice coincidence. Yeah. Um, but Brian, we have you here today. We are talking poetry. Yes. Can you let us know what's happening with the youth poetry scene this summer? This summer, we are going to take some dates, and we're going to have workshops. Uh, it's uh, going to start this August, and it's going to be uh, August 3rd through August 10th, and we're just going to have conversations through poetry. And, 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 and my question that I'm proposing is, what kind of community do you want to live in? And I think it's important to have that conversation with our youth, um, because the thing is, it is, I know it sounds cliche, but here pretty soon, they're going to be the people that are taking care of us. Absolutely. And so I feel like spoken word is, is that conduit to have these genuine conversations and to help peel back the layers. I've seen it at my other job. I've seen it uh, working with the kids that I already workshop with, whether it be through situations of uh, camps already done um but i think it's very very important to have these conversations through poetry and spoken word because i think it's a great art form and it can be very relatable we've seen amanda gorman 
go on uh, a few years ago yes. um, to the White House and whatever your political affiliation, to see this vibrant young woman speak so eloquently about the challenges that our country face, not only the challenges, but the hope, even in the most dire situations, Absolutely. to talk about yes. those things and, and to be so young doing it, it can be done here. It will be done here. And it will be something they can continue to pass the torch on for way beyond our lifetime. And so these, um, is it a, are they poetry classes or are they just going to be like creative sessions? They're going to be a mixture of poetry classes uh, and, and trying to get to a place where we can have conversations before creative writing and okay. then putting people in different uh, classes where we're going to break down ideas and, and brainstorming and creatively writing and having them perform uh, their own writings okay. and, 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 and getting them aligned to what it means to be champions for themselves. Because what we're doing is not just a camp. We want it to be whatever we're doing, whatever I'm doing, I want it to be an experience and a genuine rapport with the community. Um, youth poet laureates, they are civic minded in the first place. And they're not, and, and it's about having that eye and also like hip hop seeing and telling things that we don't normally see. And so it's about going into, we're, we're, we're excited, we're excited to be housed in the Melrose library, um, which is, is such a beautiful place. Yes, it is. And, you know, I want to see, I mean, it's my vision. I would love to see the community come out and just be supportive of this. And if they choose to make it their own. And so with this poetry camp, um, will the Roanoke Youth Poet Laureate be chosen from someone at this camp, or is that going to be a separate process? It could be. I mm -hmm. mean, it could be. The thing right now is is lighting that spark. Okay. And that's what why August is so crucial. It's about lighting that spark for a child from Roanoke City to, 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 to be the master of their own destiny in that right and to go forward and light the charge. And, and say, you, and then continue that legacy, not like a legacy from a selfish place, but from a place where beyond my words, people that make it their own, it's felt like a heartbeat on its own that is beating with or without. And so it's important to, to light that charge. I agree. I completely agree. And so with the Youth Poet Laureate, that will be chosen in October? October. Okay. Yes. Uh, and and um, with it, uh, we're developing a program uh, that is also going to be called the uh, Rhythm and Rhyme Festival that will also be held in Melrose. And uh, that's under development. We've got some surprises, hopefully, on the way for that. <laughs> That, uh, but it's a it's a it's a beautiful team of people um, like Doug and I want to say thank you to Doug for helping me, you know, and reminding me of why I do what I do. And so it's just been a community of artists and creatives and people that I've made friends with uh, poets that are local and regional and, and national who have helped. And so it's a thing of getting those people aligned with that vision to to bring something very special to Roanoke because Roanoke is very special to me. It's, it's what made me. I am a product of my environment. And so with it, it's my, my job, I feel like, um, to leave it better than where I found it now more than ever. Very well said. Well, I appreciate you being on the podcast today. Is there anything you want to leave our listeners with before we go? Hi, Mom. Um, <laughs> Hi, Mom. Yeah, it's like my mom has been very uh, proud of me, and I'm I'm very I love my mom dearly. She uh, more she was more excited the past month about the song "It's Here" that uh, me and JP Powell uh, did for the for the arts in our community, and like of all the songs I've written, over two hundred plus songs. But that is the song that she loves the most, and that is the one that she talks about 
all the time. So I want to say thank you. I love my mom. She is always, she chose to be my mom. And so she works really hard and, you know, I appreciate her and her guidance and her love and, 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 and thank you for instilling a lot of those things in me. So. Shout out Brian's mom. Hello, we, Charlotte. Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you choosing to be Brian's mom as well. And that's going to be a wrap for us this month on If You Know, You Know. Make sure that you follow along, like, review, subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.